Well, welcome everybody to this workshop and the use of citizen science within the field of cultural heritage. Um, my name is Alejandra Albuerne and I am a lecturer at the UCL Institute for Sustainable Heritage. I'm delighted to bring to you today's event, which is hosted by the Institute for Sustainable Heritage and is part of the program for the conference we have organized with the exciting occasion of the Institute's 20th anniversary. The conference is running throughout the week and I encourage you all to take a look at all the other events that are running, which are all free and open to everybody. I want to thank my colleagues at ISH and in particular the conference chair, Professor Matthias Trillick, for hosting this event as part of the conference. Uh, the workshop is organized in collaboration with SHOCK, the Social Sciences and Humanities Open Cloud, uh, which I will introduce in more detail in a minute. It is a free training event that aims to develop data skills within the social sciences and humanities domain, and more specifically in our case, within heritage science. Before we get started, I want to share some ground rules for today. Um, I would like to ask everybody to keep your microphones muted. Uh, to communicate with us, you can use the chat function in Zoom, as well as any other tools that the presenters make available throughout the session. Uh, I should let you know that the workshop is being recorded. If you do not want to feature in the recording, please keep your cameras off. There is also the option to rename yourself by clicking on the uh, three dots that appear when you hover with your mouse over your um, image tile on Zoom. And there you will find the option to rename, uh, the, the, to rename yourself uh, to change the displayed name uh, for your image. Um, if you are happy to be part of the recording, I want to invite you to turn your cameras on. I will keep my camera on throughout the event. And um, I should also let you know that after the event, we will be circulating a post-event questionnaire and we would be really grateful if you could fill it in. Um, so in the session today, there will be three parts, two shorter ones, and then we will have a much longer one uh, led by our lead presenter today, Rosa Brigham. Um, the first, in, in the first instance, I would like to introduce Shog uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with it. And then I will pass the floor over to my colleague, Joseph grau Robe, who will introduce the work that at ISH we are doing within the field of citizen science. And then finally, we'll pass the floor over to Rosie for the main section of the workshop. So without further ado, I am going to share my screen. And ooh, ooh, there you can you all see my slide? Fantastic. Um, so as I was saying, I want to very briefly introduce to you Shock, which is uh, the social sciences and humanities section of the European Open Science Cloud. And um, SHOCK is a Horizon 2020 research and innovation action that has the aim of creating the social sciences and humanities part of EOSC, where data, tools, and training will be available and accessible for uses of social sciences and humanities data. There are 47 partners in the project, and it will develop throughout 40 months we are just about to go into the final year of the project. From Shock, we want to maximize the potential of reuse of data through the promotion of open science and fair principles. Citizen science can be a really powerful vehicle to achieve this. We want to connect existing and new infrastructures, and we want to establish an appropriate governance model for the social sciences and humanities component of EOSC. For those not familiar, oh, this isn't, it isn't showing particularly well. I apologize that the images are not visible, um, but uh, all you're missing here are the, the logos uh, for the different clusters that are part of EOSC. So EOSC is the European Open Science Cloud and is an initiative at the European Commission for developing an infrastructure to provide services promoting open science. There are many components to EOSC, and one of them is a series of activities that support the integration and consolidation of thematic, 
infrastructure platforms. Shock is one of these clusters and it has its focus on social sciences and humanities, but it sits under EOSC alongside uh, four other clusters with different thematic focus, including the life sciences, photo, photon and neutron research, astronomy and particle physics, and environmental research. Um, under the shock partners, uh, we include a number of research infrastructures that are linked thematically to uh, SSH, all of which are on the roadmap of S3 the European Strategy Forum on Research Infrastructure. Some other partners represent stakeholder groups like LIBE, the League of European Libraries, or Trust IT. And there are also partners who come from, from the research uh, community, like uh, universities, like, like our own uh, UCL, the host of today's workshop. Uh, and finally, we have partners from the technology sector, like Semantic Web Company or Center Data. Uh, our work covers the entire data cycle, and we want to ensure fair principles rule from concept to collection, all the way through to analysis. Shock is working in a number of ways to link research communities and e-infrastructures. On the one hand, we want to engage and empower the research community by interconnecting them and by building expertise through training, training networks and through training events, like for example, today's workshop. On the other hand, we're working with infrastructures to promote technical uh, skills like innovation and data access and production and linking technologies and services into the SSH cloud. As part of our efforts, to connect the two, we are developing the Social Sciences and Humanities Open Marketplace where high quality data tools and services will be openly available for data producers and users. And alongside this, we will shape and implement governance for fair data that aligns with the EOSC efforts. Our objective is to connect with a diversity of stakeholders that engage with social sciences and humanities. These include universities and researchers, of course, but also the private sector, policymakers, and civil society in general. The two main ways we will do this is by offering training, by including, tra including training events like today, offering training materials and resources for trainers, and also through the open marketplace. To summarize, I'd like to finish this introduction with the impact that shock will generate. First, to integrate the social sciences and humanities component into EOSC. And then also we're developing the social sciences and humanities open marketplace that I have just mentioned. Uh, we want to make available high quality cloud ready tools and high quality SSH data. We will offer secure access mechanisms for SSH data that conform with the EU legal requirements. We will ensure that SSH have state-of-the-art research infrastructure. And finally, we want to maximize data use and reuse through open science and fair principles. This is a very brief introduction to Shock. Uh, if you would like to learn more, there is a lot of information on our website. We're also very active on, on Twitter and LinkedIn. Uh, so please join our community. There is lots of opportunities there for any uses of data in the social sciences and humanities. Um, and that completes my introduction to Shock. Um, if there are any questions, you may pose them in the chat and I will try to address them throughout the presentation. Um, but next, I would like to introduce my colleague, Josep Grauvove, who is a lecturer in science and engineering in arts, heritage and archaeology. And his work explores the interface where technology meets preventive conservation. Josep is interested in how new computational developments can support preventive conservation management. And he's currently working on applying information modeling, citizen science and system dynamics in heritage science. Josep, the floor is over to you. 
Thank you, Alejandra, and also thanks to uh, Shock for inviting Rosie and I to conduct this workshop. I will speak very briefly. Um, I just want to double check that I'm successfully sharing my screen with all of you. Perfect. Yes, you are. Um, I will only speak with five minutes or so to run through the different types of citizen science uh, that we have experience of in, in the Institute for Sustainable Heritage. I will also try to use this to define what we might mean by citizen science. Uh, it's a word that means different things to different people, but very simply, we could consider it for the purposes of this discussion to be any scientific activity that by design involves somehow people outside uh, the university, the public or citizens. And we've done it uh, in many different ways. Uh, Rosie and I, teach in a course called uh, MSc in Data Science for Cultural Heritage that has a whole module dedicated to citizen science. And we use it both to train scientists on how to run citizen science projects, but also to explore its boundaries and try new things. And for example, one of the things that we have experience of in ISH is directly engaging the public in scientific ex experiments. We have a mobile lab, we call it the, the, uh, the Mobile Heritage Lab, and we have used it to visit schools and museums, and, and we have involved um, all, all sorts of uh, communities into uh, making scientific uh, measurements. This sometimes uh, can be uh, very quantitative, quantitative, and we can get very useful scientific information from it, and sometimes the main purpose is it's purely educational. There's not an exact division between the two tasks. Uh, there's a continuum. The examples I'm showing here, the one above, um, corresponds to research uh, carried out uh, by a colleague in archaeology, Chris Lockyer, um, in, in collaboration with the Mobile Heritage Lab, where he involves communities in analyzing underground, um, underground archaeology. The image below is an image of some high school, stu uh, high, high school st um, students uh, from Cardiff, monitoring pollutants in the National Museum in Cardiff in data that is actually useful later for preventive conservation. This is one type of citizen science. But current, um, let's say, portable smartphone technologies um, enable another kind of citizen science where with uh, a very small bit or um, unit of participation, by citizens and participants, we can obtain data of interest to conservation. One example is the Monument Monitor project in which we gather pictures uh, from historic sites and we try to map several aspects of this preservation. So if you walk to some of the of site of uh, managed by historic environment in Scotland, you can find signs like this that request you to take a picture and share it with us. We've done this type of research in other contexts, for example, also indoors. Um, to trying to quantify color change using smartphone photography. And we also engage on uh, what's called um, participatory contributions in, in a, uh, online. So for example, without the need of a smartphone, for example, using the platform Zooniverse, a project that we have done recently with some of our MSc students is trying to classify the levels of damage of a site um, that appeared, um, you, some of you may know it in the series Outlander. Um, it's called uh, Clava Cairns and it became uh, really popular because of the series. Erosion has increased as a result. So we have images submitted by users of the site over many years and we are trying to ask um, observers, ask the public how they feel about these pictures and classify different levels of damage. We've done a similar thing recently with collections of, of historic combs of different ages and different museums, trying to see how the public perceives, perceives them as, as degraded and whether this degradation is an acceptable or acceptable in some cases, how it relates to the possibilities of exhibiting it and how it relates to material properties. So that's research that we cannot conduct if we don't involve the public in some capacity in an interactive way. If I try to summarize this, I mean, I'm an engineer and I like putting things in axis. And one of the ways I like to conceptualize citizen science is using two axes, looking at the educational value of the activity on one hand and the scientific value it gives on the other hand. 
there is a very broad spectrum of things that you can do within this axis. And the examples that I've shown you fall in different locations. Sometimes um, the public learn a lot and scientists don't learn so much. And sometimes it's the absolute opposite. We get very good data, very repeatable that we can use for scientific analysis, but the public only learns a little bit from participating. Of course, um, there's a sweet spot that balances both, but I, I don't want to present this as any sort of gradation of, of value. I think uh, valuable and, and interesting projects can be done in any part of this plot, except perhaps at the corner where you have low educational value and low scientific value, but any, anywhere else you can have very valuable projects. And that's everything I have to say. Uh, Rosie that will present next has experience in many of these types of, of engagement. And you, she's the perfect person to, to um, walk you uh, through the main steps in designing it. Uh, she's been doing uh, now for, for three years a PhD in our department focused on this topic in collaboration with Historic Environment Scotland and uh, co-funded by EPSRC, the Engineering and, and Physical Sciences Research Council. And Rosie has a perfect combination of, of the perspective of a historian, the skill of a programmer, and also the, the multidisciplinary outlook of a heritage scientist. And I think it's, it's very difficult to find these three things in a single person, but they are maybe the three things that you need in order to do successful citizen science projects. Over to you, Rosie. Gosh, thank you very much, Joseph. Um, let me just share my screen. Excellent. Can everyone see that? Yes. Great. Okay. Um, thank you, Joseph. That's quite an introduction. Um, I wouldn't say you need to specifically be me to succeed in citizen science. Um, <laughs> I think anyone can. Um, but uh, what have we got? We've got about 40 minutes, so I've got lots to talk about. So let's crack on. I'm going to try really hard and not gabble. I've got a little sign here telling me to slow down because especially when I'm doing online presentations, I have a, a habit to, to my words can run away. So I will try as much as possible to be as clear and succinct. But if I do start mumbling, please let me know. OK, so um, hello, who am I? What do I do? What is this presentation about and who is it for? Um, as Joseph said, I am Rosie. I'm a researcher at the ISH. Um, I have been working, uh, researching citizen science for four year, three or four years now. I started Monument Monitor Project and more recently we've started the Dinosaur Monument Monitor Project. Um, these are two super cool projects that involve um, visitors to Scottish heritage sites to send in photographs, send in data, and then we use that to see what useful conservation data we can basically get from visitors' photographs. We've got a similar one with Dinosaur Monitor that's based at Crystal Palace with the Crystal Palace dinosaurs. And with that, we're trying to create a historical conservation record using visitors' old photographs. It's super cool. Um, I'm not gonna focus too much on this now, but I will be using data that I've collected from these projects to sort of reinforce some of the points that I want to make when we're, when we're planning some fake um, citizen science projects. Um, what is this presentation about and who is it for? Um, this presentation is about planning citizen science projects and things that I think are really important to consider during the planning process to make sure that they are as successful as possible. Um, I sort of designed it for people who are aware of cultural heritage and are maybe thinking of creating a project in the future or maybe have experience with it and want to sort of reflect on uh, their project. Um, what is citizen science? I'm not going to focus too much on this because um, I think the definition and people's awareness of citizen science is quite high now, especially in the last year. Um, I don't know about you, but I've been um, contributing every day to the COVID symptom study app, um, which is an example of amazing effective citizen science in action with the COVID symptom study app. We have been able to see uh, the progression of the pandemic and various different symptoms. Um, 
in real time. Um, but these could, but citizen science can be on any level. It can be micro, it can be macro, like the app. Um, you know, it can involve just using ten people to explore. Um, archaeological features in a local area and report back. It could be using Zooniverse to tra transcribe or analyze data, or it could be something like Monument Monitor. The general idea is getting a group of people together who are not necessarily domain experts to contribute towards a project. Um, there's a lot of interesting politics around the terminology of citizen science. Um, I have included a link to one of my favorite papers um, at the end of this presentation. So if you're interested in sort of more of the terminology and the definitions, then I do recommend that. Um, but in essence, citizen science projects are more complicated than traditional research projects. Um, that is because in order to be access successful, there are three aspects that must work. It needs to be engaging enough to capture the attention of a population of people. Users then need to be engaged enough to collect or sort the data, which could possibly be over a period of time. And then finally, the collected data, which needs to be relevant, needs to be actually used and applied in the purpose of which the project was envisaged. So this creates three main areas in which citizen science projects can fail or falter, which is engagement, data collection and data use. So I sort of surmised what I think of as a sort of normal research project or, or normal sort of project where you have a proposal, research, analysis, results. If you're in academia, that might be a pub, like the pack, a publication or it's sort of a useful application in the real world. Um, if you're talking about a citizen science or crowdsourcing project, you have this level of extra complex extra complexity involved in that project alongside the traditional proposal research analysis results and application you have more complexity you have to have community scoping you have to have initial engagement you need to have prolonged engagement with that community um, you need because you'll be um, likely using people that are not necessarily domain level experts you will likely need to do more data cleaning and more data aggregation and then finally and really importantly you will need to do impact reporting to your volunteer community you need to show them how their contribution and how their time has been spent and impacted the work in real terms and that has to be in an appropriate medium big no-no to any kind of academic publication behind a paywall. Um, if in doubt, if you're publish publishing any kind of citizen science work in an academic setting, it always has to be open source. Um, so what are we gonna do in the next couple, next half hour or so? I have created, I have created two projects, um, two different types of projects. As I say, citizen science and crowdsourcing projects can be anything. I've take, I've created um, two which are quite general, which are quite common uh, within cultural heritage. And what I want to do is discuss as a group and suggest key issues to consider for different parts of each project. And the point of this is that if any of you then go on to maybe develop your own project, um, this sort of exercise will help you um, plan for almost every eventuality. It will help you consider what resources you need to both at the start and continuing and at the end of the project. And I want to, <laughs> it's also my platform just to tell you to always think data first. So um, we have, if, if this was uh, in normal times and we were all meeting in person, I would give Group, I would split you up into groups and I'd give you all this worksheet and I'd send you all into different corners of the room and ask you to fill it out. Unfortunately, that is not the case. Um, so what I will be attempting, I am uh, presenting this on Mentimeter at the moment. So hopefully you will all be able to access the Mentimeter slides when we get to it and you'll be able to comment and we will all be able to see everyone's comments and we can discuss from there. Hopefully this will work. I have a backup if it doesn't. Um, so this is my worksheet for us to work through. Um, you will see that I have put data collection first and with the largest section. This is because I think this is possibly the most important thing to consider at the planning stage of a, um, of a citizen science project. You need to think of that first because you need to 
it's, it's very easy to sit down and think, oh, let's do a citizen science project. Let's get people to um, transcribe this data and then and then then we can use it. But you need to know what that data looks like so that you can use it. If you want the result of the project to be applicable, you need to know and think very carefully exactly what the data that you want to end up with looks like so that it can actually be applicable and that the people's time that you're recruiting is not gone to waste. So the sort of way that I recommend looking at these projects is to focus on what the result you want to look like first and then go back and think about the community. And when you think about exactly what data you need to collect looks like, that will help you shape exactly what community you need to engage and how you engage the community in order to get the most useful data. Okay, so um, to so as a sort of exercise, um, I'm proposing uh, two projects. Um, these are not real projects. These are invented projects that I have just thought might be a cool idea. Um, the first one is plant monitoring at Angkor Wat. Angkor, um, if uh, you have been lucky enough to visit or if you don't know about it, is this amazing temple complex in Cambodia. Um, made famous, I think, from Tomb Raider. I'm not the I'm not the big, I don't have the biggest know-how of um, computer games, um, but they are wonderful temples. It's a World Heritage Site, um, but being in a jungle, they do suffer from severe level of vegetation encroachment, and they have a fantastic team of gardeners and conservators whose job it is to basically scale the very steep and quite crumbly walls and roofs of these uh, monuments and remove all the saplings before they start to destroy the masonry. Um, it is a constant task. And in this project, the idea would be to ask tourists, ask visitors to capture photos of high level um, saplings, high level plant growth and submit them to the conservation team so that they can monitor plant growth around the site. So that's the first. Um, oh, also, I need to add a caveat to this. Let's imagine this project is in 2017 and that there is no pandemic on and that people can easily visit the site and walk around it as normal. Let's be time travelers just for this session. <laughs> Um, so the second, so that's that, that that is a project that involves uh, inviting visitors to contribute data, and uh, similar to Monument Monitor, asking people to give, uh, yeah, contribute data in the form of photographs. And now the second one that we're also going to consider is one where um, contributors and volunteers are asked to analyze data. So in this instance. A small museum has been bequeathed a chest of diaries detailing the lives of Ursula Graham Bauer through her time as the first female general of the army in World War II. Um, she's super cool. And if you haven't heard of her, Google her after this session. Um, so this small museum has been given this amazing chest of diaries, which has an amazing um, insight into the front across the Burmese border and fighting with Japan during World War II. They want to digitize these records, they want to publicize her work, and they want to make the digital copies available on the website for researchers. So this is the second, um, this is the second project that we're going to discuss and think about. So let's crack on. Uh, so uh, if you visit menti.com and use the code 52122353, I think I might try and put this in the chat. There we go. Can. Oh, is that the voting is closed. This is the first time I've ever used Mentimeter, so I'm not. Uh, <laughs> so hopefully this will work. Uh, open voting. Uh, 
Has anyone been able to write anything and it hasn't turned up yet? I, I don't see the link. Okay. So if you go to menti.com. I get it, I get it. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. And then the code is, I've put it in the chat, it's 52122353. And I want you to suggest what issues should be considered. Oh, it's closed again. Ah, open voting. Hey, excellent. <laughs> Wow, it's so much easier in person with pen and paper and post-it notes. <laughs> yeah, date and time of photographs, absolutely. It's very difficult. If you have loads of photographs and you have no idea when they've been taken, you really need to know that, especially if you want to track when seedlings have germinated. Locations, directions of the photos, absolutely geospatial locations of the photos. Absolutely, these are often um, programmed in very fancy cameras. Quality of the photo, photo settings, getting people to photograph, absolutely. Yeah, visitors are interested in only certain parts. So that is a very key aspect of this type of research. You will naturally start to have bias in the fact that visitors will generally submit lots of photos of the photographic elements of a site. So you need to make sure that your messaging is key. Tourist motivation to participate. Yeah, these are all absolutely fantastic. Proximity of data visually, geospatial location of data. Can everyone see the results that are coming up on the screen? Just uh, excellent, great, thank you. Language of data tagging or notes, that is very important when you think who the end user is going to be. Scales of the photographs, absolutely. Um, keywords, tags and geotags is something that's come up quite a lot. Um, giving, giving credits to contributors, that is very true. That's an interesting one with these types of um, projects. Sometimes uh, copyright is sort of given over and uh, because managing lots of people's copyright is very difficult when you're being sent thousands of photographs. Um, so, and also then you also can keep uh, personal data. So sometimes it's easy just to say by sending in this photograph, um, you give us permission to use it for these purposes. We won't save any of your personal information not saving personal information then becomes very difficult when people send you photos of their faces which is really annoying <laughs> um these are absolutely fantastic i think everyone has thought of some really good privacy of people capturing the photos absolutely um you don't want photos of people's faces because that counts as personal data even though this project is based in cambodia it's and isn't within the scope of gdpr um, it's nice to have very strong data protection in place. And I generally think that you shouldn't save um, photos involving faces on databases. Um, yeah, copyright to, this is fantastic. Right, okay, so I'm going to pause for now and we're just going to uh, close, I'm gonna close voting. Excellent, I've done that successfully. Um, and now I'm just going to carry on just to think about some of the things that we have discussed and some of the things that have been brought up. I think one of the most, a couple of people mentioned this, I think one of the most important things to think about um, when you're asking people to submit data is thinking what are the end users going to be for this data? Who is going to use the data? I mean, in this case, it will be the gardeners and conservation team at um, the temple complex. So the, the submissions need to be presented to them in a way that's easily accessible, in the way that's probably portable. Do they have, what technology do they have access to? Um, is, do, do, do they need to then be, does the data then need to be stored in some form of database? Is that database going to be online? If that database is going to be online, is it going to use um, an existing software? Is it 
does something bespoke need to be built for it? If the images are going to be hosted online, where are they going to be hosted? What are the cost implications of that hosting? How long does the funding have for hosting those images online? All of these have small little implications that have to be dug deep down. Um, the image here is uh, the software that I have built for Monument Monitor to provide the conservation architects with um, in time information of submissions submitted to, to the Monument Monitor project. So here they're able to filter the submissions by site, um, by submission type and by any tags um, attributed to the images. For example, here we've got um, fallen trees damaging and littering. So it's really important, I think, to start with the end user of the product uh, or of the project and then think about what data needs to be collected in order to make that as useful as possible in this case for the gardeners. So I think another, another, um, another a few people really mentioned this, how should contributors submit their images? And so there's, there was a lot of reference for geotagging, the direction of the camera, where the camera is. Um, if people are submitting their images that's um, through common themes and not through a bespoke app, uh, you can see here that WhatsApp, Twitter and Instagram all compress their images quite significantly and they strip all the XF data out, EXIF data out. So that is the, that is the uh, metadata on images that includes the, 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 the kind of information that you might want to collect, such as what model the camera is, where it was taken exactly in the complex um, and uh, what the time of day was. Um, you can see here that Gmail doesn't. So for high quality cameras, so if we're trying to capture um, small de details on far away, so in second, first and second story structures, we generally want high quality images. So probably email is best for this um, situation. Um, I'd also, also because of the geolocation of, uh, because where Cambodia is, Telegram and Weibo are also very popular. So I'd consider those as well. I haven't been using them. Um, I haven't been using them for this project, so I don't know those sort of uh, details to pass on. So um, finally, uh, another another thing that I think is worth noting is how is how are we going to convey to the participants um, how to uh, really make this data useful? You know, is it going to be through signage? Is it going to be through a website? Is it going to be through an app? Um, the more specific, the more useful you can make your data being submitted to a project as early on, uh, the less time you will have in data filtering. So if you can make sure that people are taking images as specific as possible to your requirements, it will make your job a lot easier. And so, so you want to really avoid sort of these Instagram posts of people just being like, oh my gosh, yay, I'm traveling, um, and promote ones that are much more specific uh, with examples of exactly what temple, where in the complex it is, um, with really good directions and with a clear indication of sort of what's in place. So these are just some ideas um, to consider for data collection. Um, Louis, yes, these are um, all blocked in mainland China, but um, this in this theoretical project, we are based in Cambodia where the, none of these te technologies are blocked. Obviously, if we're in mainland China, that would be another thing to consider. You know, what is not blocked? Um, how can people submit their data? Um, but obviously, this is, I'm just using this uh, as a sort of this project as a sort of exercise to get you thinking about what kind of things you need to consider in regards to data. So let's move on to our second project. What issues can be considered, should be considered in regard to data collection or transcription for the Naga Queen project. So I get so it open voting. No, that says voting is closed. Oh. Okay, so hopefully this, if you're still, if you still have the project, uh, the presentation open in your screens, hopefully you should be able to see and comment on this. Excellent, thank you. Um, so this kind of project would probably take place on a platform such as Zooniverse. So what do we need to think about in regard to the data collection for the end user of the project? So the end user would be um, someone, a researcher who maybe wants to 
be able to more easily access the information about Ursula Graham Bauer. Quality of the transcription, absolutely. Um, handwrite, transcribing handwrite, handwritten text is notoriously difficult. Um, <laughs> I have, I, I, I take my hat off to those people who spend a lot of time um, transcribing texts. Um, Cross-referencing multiple transcriptions for accuracy, absolutely review of transcribed text, absolutely, this is all super important. Sensitive content, yes. If this is going to be a publicly accessible forum and there is maybe some information that is either explicit, that may be something that you should consider. Yeah, absolutely. If you have several people transcribing a project, and if you have, for example, one page and five different people transcribe that page, it can be very difficult to amalgamate um, the different types of transcriptions that people have come across. Um, so I, for this type of project, I would recommend Zooniverse because they have spent an awful lot of time working in aggregation for transcription. So I think there's some really useful um, thoughts there. Um, so let's just go on to, um, I think issues especially to consider for this is how will the end user access the submitted data? Will this be uploaded to a website? And will the documents be searchable on the website? So this is something that I have come across with other people who have done transcription projects and then uploaded the transcriptions onto a database. If you upload all the transcriptions up into a database, if you think it's a whole book of text, that might put it, uh, that, that might change the parameters of your search engine quite significantly. Because if you've now got a book of text in a database, you've got a lot of ands or ifs ands. And so if you search for something quite innocuous, it might not be quite so easy to access the exact transcription or other things in your database that you were there originally. Um, so if you don't want to do that, maybe you want to think about keywords. And if you want to do keywords, how are you going to um, how, uh, how are keywords going to be assigned? Is that something that you will ask transcribers to do? So, so Zooniverse has um, really good uh, ways of amalgamating um, transcriptions. So I think that can be, um, that can be left to Zooniverse, um, but also data augmentation. Here we've got several different ways of saying the same date which we as humans can read and very easily identify that that is the same date. But a computer might not necessarily know if it's just looking at transcribed text. Um, so how are you going to augment the data so that it is easily searchable? Do you have the technological um, resources within your team to make sure that the transcribed data um, is as easily accessible as possible in the end format? And finally, um, Zooniverse is an incredibly powerful platform and it is wonderfully easy to use. They have made it, um, they, they have made it so easy to set up projects. And we have a couple, and it's been really fun uh, on the MS, uh, MSE um, course, uh, getting students to set up their own Zooniverse projects and, and, and go through that process with them. It is, however, slightly more difficult to interpret the data that you get which is unsurprising because, you know, as, as we were saying, and, and, and as you mentioned previously, um, amalgamating five different people's interpretation of written text is complex. And this is the kind of output you, that you can get. Um, you can't necessarily see the detail, I'm afraid, because it's quite a poor image, but you get the idea. It's a block of information and you do need some level of technical literacy to be able to pull out the transcriptions individually and reduce them into individual texts. So that is something that you perhaps need to consider. Do we have the technical resources to actually deal with the data at the end of this project and think about, or uh, bef before starting any kind of Zooniverse project, think about how you can access the data at the end. So, okay, let's move on to the next section of our worksheet. 
community in regards to the kind of data that we want to collect what community do we need to engage for the ANCOR project so we know we need to we would preferably like quite high quality images who do we need to engage and how should we engage with them I love this. This is such a good mix. Local visitors, travellers, anybody. Um, tourists need to consider different language, local community and staff, museum specialists. I, I think I agree with all of these um, suggestions. I think for this type of project, you really want to involve as many people, as many stakeholders in that building as possible. You know, you want to involve the local communities because it is their it is their property, it is their site, it is part of their heritage. But I think there's a lot to be said about actively involving visitors and tourists, because um, what I found with the Monument Monitor project is by actively asking people to look for and send in data about conservation issues, it makes them much more aware of the conservation issues, which might give them uh, more um, investment in looking after the property instead of just visiting the property and the sort of long-term care of it. Um, I think there's a lot to be said for sort of um, local tour guides as well. Um, but yeah, so I think, so to, ooh, there we go. So to, as a sort of comparison, the, the vast majority of um, contributors to the Monument Monitor project have not been local to the site, um, which is quite surprising because with the, we, this was this these um, data come from a post submission survey that we started just in in August or September of 2020. So just after we were coming, just just after the sort of the small section of summer where we could have loads of fun, but then also just before the second and third lockdown where no one was allowed to go anywhere. So still within these lockdowns, we've still had the majority of people not who do not consider themselves local to the site. So we've got a lot of active engagement with people who's, who don't necessarily um, see the site as their local heritage. And interesting, the, the main motivations for submitting were interest in contributing to scientific research and conservation and interest in the site. So there is that real, um, so it sort of peaks that interest of I want to help uh, help with the research of this site and help with um, the conservation of this site, uh, which we think at HESS is a really powerful way to um, connect people more with the sites that they're visiting instead of just as a passive tourist. Um, so let's think about the community that needs to be engaged for the Naga Queen project. And this is a very different type of community. We're thinking uh, this is an online transcription project. So how do we reach people for an online transcription project? This is a small museum. Um, how do, who, who and who do they contact and how? History students, absolutely. Um, I, I remember my, when Zooniverse first launched when I was an undergrad, um, my, uh, my friends who were all astrophysics uh, students were all told to go to Zooniverse uh, when it was first set up with its first ever project and they had to all do half an hour in Zooniverse every day as a sort of mandatory point of their course. History students are, are fantastic <laughs> in that similar way. Yeah, history groups on social media, local, local historian communities. I think, yeah, highly literate people. We're talking about handwritten text in English. So there has to be, so you are restricting this to people who are very good English speakers and people who can read handwriting and reading handwriting definitely eliminates me from that list. Um, yeah, those are some really uh, good, I think I, I, I agree with all of those points. 
um, just to sort of consider this is this map here shows uh, the location of Zooniverse participants and volunteers um, worldwide and you can see that there's it's uh, mainly focused in Europe and America so it's uh, a little bit more difficult to um, the nature of this project will be a lot smaller you need highly literate people that can read language uh, that can read handwritten English and reasonably archaic, archaic handwritten English um, and also sort of the thing that would probably be best suited for this sort of project is starting with the local museum um, volunteer base uh, most museums have a sort of a nice community in their, their newsletters and then and then local interest groups and local history groups are absolutely fantastic lots of people are very dedicated but you're also looking for people with more time on their hands as well so it's majority of transcription projects are often within uh, the retired community um, which is fantastic um, okay so now let's think a bit long term let's think about community management so long term how should the communities engaged in the ANCOR project be managed long term? What kind of ways uh, should, should the project utilise to make sure that um, visitors remain engaged and um, other stakeholders of the project remain engaged as well? Yeah. <coughs> yeah, I think these are all fantastic suggestions. Workshops in local schools, absolutely. That kind of local engagement, I think, is crucial for these types of projects. New motives, yes, you need to keep uh, people interested. Explaining why it is important is, I think, absolutely crucial to these types of projects blogcasts, updates, making the most of social media to show people, to physically show people, you know, how their contributions have helped. Social media, absolutely perfect. Social channel with before and after pictures. Yes, people love that, uh, including myself, um, including them in the solutions for preservation. Absolutely, the more engagement that you can make with these communities, the better. I think very much in citizen science project, you need to consider it can basically conceptualize it as a two-way relationship between contributor and researcher. It's not just, hello volunteer, give me the data I need. You know, it needs to be a two-way connection. You you give them and they give that, you know, you show them how you're they're contributing, you know, edu certain level of sort of like engagement within the project, certain level of education, and then they and then in, in return you as a researcher can get some nice data to help with the project um disseminate publications website yeah these are all fantastic um i very much agree with all of these and um, these um so this is some of the again some of the responses i've had from the monument monitor um feedback survey and you can see that um this is something that i haven't been able to implement in the way that i would like for monument monitor i have basically my my results get disseminated through twitter and uh, my um, and my um, Instagram account. Do you follow me at Monument Monitor? Um, but that's about it. I haven't been able to set up a newsletter or a sort of blog and post social post updates. So you can see that some of the people really want to, to visibly see where their data is going and what it's helping towards. Um, so I think that those types of things are absolutely crucial, again, to show people that what they have contributed is helping and to actively engage them in the project and in the research. Um, how about community project for the Naga Queen project? Now, this is, I think, quite similar in, in regards to the Angkor Wat project. I think there are a lot of similar themes in, reg in, in regards to making, showing people the results of their work and um, often change, ch changing uh, adding new sections to a project for a sort of motivation, adding new things in. Um, anyone got any other, I'm keen to hear though, if anyone has any uh, other ideas.
yeah. Um, participants communicating with each other is actually really important. So that's something um, that Zooniverse, in the, in the creation of Zooniverse, I think it, it started about 10 years ago, and only about two years in did it introduce a chat function. And through the chat function, people who uh, were, in, the, in this particular instance, they were um, no, um, analyzing and data and tagging um, images of galaxies. And um, the chat function allowed people who were doing an awful lot of that to compare notes and say, oh, guys, we've just noticed this green smudge. Has anyone else noticed a green smudge? And through this chat function, um, lots of people were able to share their experiences with these green smudges. And so enough data was able to be collected to go back to the researchers and, and, and say, we've got all these images that we found with green smudges. You know, we're, we're all now experts in this database. What can it mean? And the researchers went back and were like, oh, fantastic. You guys have discovered a new shape, a new type of universe, um, which just, which I think is just demonstrable of how important it is to allow participants to communicate freely in these types of projects. Um, family responses to data info, absolutely. Webinar presenting results to participants, I think that is fantastical and showing the research that is done, showing the applied research that is done. Um, and I, I agree with that. And I also think it should um, be done in the most appropriate format for the contributors to the project. So always think of who was working on this project and how should the research done be shown to them? Is it correct to show to, to, to just publish this in an academic journal or do other forms need to be done like a webinar or a video blog posts, even sort of um, tweet slideshows type things. Um, so one issue, uh, so, so with, the, with the Angkor Wat project, um, you don't necessarily need to retain engagement in the same level because in, in similar to Monument Monitor, the majority of participants are one-time users who visit the site, take photographs, um, and then go away and you have a sort of underlying amount of people who are dog walkers that go every other week and take photos. Um, this graph shows um, the summer of last year where something happened in the world which meant that none of us could leave our homes uh, or visit heritage sites. So in order to try and still get some data, I started a Monument Monitor at Home campaign. So I um, basically launched a PR campaign asking anyone and everyone in Scotland to send me photos of the heritage sites in question. And you can see here the dotted lines are the publication dates and the pink uh, bars represent um, submissions that were a direct result from these publications. And you can see incredibly quickly after these publications, engagement drops. So if you're doing an ongoing project that requires ongoing engagement from a community of people, it is so important to spend and plan enough time and resources to enable that ongoing engagement. Um, another, another example, so if, especially if it's a Zooniverse project, you need to think who in your team will monitor this project, who will reply to all of the questions. Who are you, um, setting up, uh, replying to everyone's questions, creating chat boards, um, basically creating and cultivating a community of people to maintain engagement, to show volunteers but that what they are contributing is valued by you, the project owner. So just to demonstrate this, I want to show you uh, this project. This is a Zooniverse project that I made from my data. I threw it up in January. Uh, I, I did a couple of tweets about it. I, I, I bullied UCL into writing a blog post about it. And, and, and I, I've left it. I've left it for about three months. And yes, it's 38% it's complete. There are 443 subjects, which is quite nice, but it's been on 38% complete for about six weeks. It hasn't moved at all. But that is also because I haven't done anything about it. I've just put it up there and left it. If you just leave things, people will not um, contribute. They will not give their time. You need to 
make sure that you show people that they are valued um just just throwing up a, a project on zooniverse and leaving it and just expecting people to spend their time classifying levels of grammar. even my dad even my dad who is really really behind this project hasn't sat down and spent every day classifying levels of groundwater level um so it's really important that you don't just think a project will complete itself plan the resources to make sure that your community is engaged um so fantastic. So I think that I think we're pretty much at time. I'm slightly running over, but let's just think back to our original worksheet. Um, and yeah, this is the sort of things that we've been discussing. Data collection. You need to think what data needs to be collected, where will it be stored, who will have access to it, how, what are the technical ramifications to this data? What is what does good data look like? What does bad data look like? How can we plan to make sure we don't get the bad data? Um, what, is there a data minimum? Is there a minimum of data this project needs in order to be successful? Uh, what resources are needed to deal with this data and how much time will data augmentation collection and analysis take? How does this need to be planned into the project? And then the community, who is this project for? Who will be participating? I put this at the bottom, but I should have put it at the top. How will barriers to participation be removed? You need to think inclusively within the remit of your project. And then finally, how will the engagement with this community managed? Who is responsible for this management and how much time and resources are available? Um, it's easy to think that a citizen science project will involving volunteers to either collect or analyze your data will mean that you can just get a whole load of data analysis done for free and it won't cost you anything it will it will cost you so much time very often it will be cheaper in terms of time and resources just to go and analyze that data yourself uh, <laughs> it will it, it make sure that you don't think it's a, it's a two it's very much a two-way kind of project and you need to make sure that you plan the resources to maintain project momentum okay i think i think i rambled on for enough now uh, I think we maybe have a couple of minutes to take questions. Um, Alejandra, is that okay? I'm aware I've I think, gone over. I think that's okay. I've realized that we've, we're going over, over the end uh, time, but for those who cannot stay, we will make the recording available. So I, I'd be happy uh, to continue for a few minutes taking a few questions. Thank you, Rosie. Um, Elia, I'm just going to answer a question that I've uh, seen you've put in the chat. Um, I'm assuming this is in relation to the Angkor Wat uh, project. Um, is it possible to tag areas of priority to take photographs? Um, that kind of uh, instruction would need to be done where people are engaged with what the project is. So with Monument Monitor, for a lot of our signage, we have um, a picture of, of the site and we've highlighted exactly what um, what we want to be taken, which really helps with showing um, contributors exactly what is useful and what is not useful. And that's really helped in comparison with sites where we haven't done that. It's really helped give us better data. Um, Joseph, is that you, you said, is, are we writing a <laughs> Uh, talk no, about that. Ignore it. I was responding to earlier. Okay, great. <laughs> um, talking about engaging young younger participants, I have to admit I haven't done massive amounts of engagement with uh, school children. Um, the majority of my research has been uh, with partis with visitors to heritage sites, which have generally been the older generations um i think in t when you when you're starting to look at at um engagement for school children you also need to think of an extra layer of skill set which is also science communication um and being able to communicate science in a way that is both accessible and engaging um that is uh not something that i can speak to because i haven't got too much experience of it Joseph, I wonder if you want to say anything about working with school children. Mm. Yes, but what we have done with the school children, 
I think it's more on the side of engagement and citizen science. It is true that we, as part of engagement, we have done small experiments within a, a, gami a gamified context. So making up a, a story where the experiments were meaningful and so on. And, and that resulted in brilliant um, levels of engagement. I, I would be hard pressed to say it resulted in any brilliant science. You know. uh, it, it's an interesting area and some others have, have done it. Um, it's simply that as, as Rosie says, your motivation needs to be to create great quality engagement and you need to plan an investment of time and resources for this. And especially in the case of working with, with children, um, you cannot plan it as simply as a way to obtain data, let's say, and it's obvious in this case. If there are any other questions, you may type them on the chat. Um, there's one question just come up uh, from Nigel Blades. Uh, can you give an example of useful findings for researchers from the data? Yes. Uh, hi, Nigel. Um, so I don't have necessarily useful findings for either of the Angkor Wat or Naga Queen projects because those I invented uh, two days ago. Um, but for the Monument Monitor project, we've had loads of successes with that. Um, we've it's, it's basically been uh, a way in I think in five different occasions uh, the submissions have alerted uh, site managers to uh, like issues such as vandalism, heritage crime, and uh, as as you saw in one of the slides, a tree falling on a Neolithic kern, which wasn't ideal. Um, we've also had uh, anecdotal evidence from uh, one of the site managers that since the signs have gone up. Um, Anti-social behavior has dropped, which we are associating with people who visit, visit the sites, because these are all in unstaffed sites. So visitors are more aware that the sites are being actively looked after, and they tend not to disrespect or, or, or do anti-social behaviors if, if they're aware that actually there is that people do come and look after these sites, and these sites are important for people. Um, We've also been able with the with the submitted data. We've also been able to, on a more quantitative level, um, track uh, flooding and um, groundwater flooding at one of the sites, and as Joseph mentioned earlier, erosion, and be able to attribute that to different levels of uh, visitor footfall over the years, um, which has been uh, really rather exciting. And um, yeah, so those are a couple of instances from Monument Monitor. Oh, Joseph, yes. Um, yes, thanks, Rosie. I just wanted to add um, um, something to this. That if we look at the agents of deterioration, I think the ones that are, are obviously very easy to, to, to track are uh, risks and, and things that happen unexpectedly and extreme events and so on. The things that happen gradually are a lot more difficult to measure. But as Rosie says, we have measured some, but not without a great deal of, of effort. And the question is often, well, if you want to measure erosion or if you may want to measure flooding, uh, reviewers, when they review our papers and people always ask us, why don't you put a webcam instead? You know, why, why going through the trouble of trying to align the images taken by visitors from different angles um, that maybe requires a 3D model and some automatic processing of the angles of the pictures plus some artificial intelligence to, to interpret whatever is in the pictures. Um, it's a lot of work to measure something that could be measurable with a webcam that's always in the same location. Um, the answer to this is, well, we wouldn't do it if it didn't have the additional benefit of, of engagement, isn't it? And it's perhaps uh, as a result of the nature of the case studies that we have studied, many are outdoors and, and unstaffed and so on, the, there is a lot of variability between submissions, but the research that we have conducted in labs in the lab indicates that we could obtain also repeatable measurements if we did things indoors, like in maybe more constant lighting with a sign that prompts visitors to have a relatively regular angle and so on. So I think let's, there is lots of scope for 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 quantification, but but again, if you have 
if you remember that you are doing it to create engagement as well. Otherwise, there's always an easier way to, to do it. Thank you. There's one other question that has come up on the chat, and, and I think looking at the time, would, that could be our, our last question. Uh, how about qualitative data provided by the community? Any suggestions, methods on how to process, organize, analyze the challenges of qualitative data? Yes, that is, that is an ongoing project. I don't, uh, there, there is a lot of really interesting work out there that I can point you to, um, but we uh, are really thinking that, uh, especially for Monument Monitor, the way it provides people to um, contribute, not just, you know, qualitative measurements, but also what they think about their local heritage and to really get a good idea of heritage values. So that is um, something that we're looking to in the future. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Rosie and Josep, for this wonderful session. Um, I hope it has been uh, as interesting and useful for everybody as it has for me. Citizen science is not directly my field of work, but I see how exciting it is. And this gives me a lot of, a lot of ideas of how I may introduce it into, into my research in the future. So thank you very much. Um, uh, before we go, just uh, to remind everybody that we will be sending a, a follow-up questionnaire and also that we will be hosting another short workshop tomorrow on uh, digitizing of museum objects. So please join us for that. Um, thank you all very much and uh, take care. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Bye.